Good morning. Welcome to this morning's study. And um, we're going to continue placing um, the details of the present truth of Daniel chapter 11 with the historical application. Um, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for this time that we have to study here this morning, and we invite your spirit's presence as we open your word together. We know, Lord, that there's many things that we don't understand, and that we are struggling to understand this fully, and so we just ask that you can um, correct us when we are in error and give us a clear understanding of this prophecy. We know many people are watching, and watching this process. Lord, um, we know that um, those that are searching for truth will also be guided by your spirit to understand these things. So be with us now. May your angel speak to watch over us and your Holy Spirit speak to each heart. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. So, well, Dwight, it's nice to see you here. Did you uh, watch the video from yesterday? I started watching part of it. Okay. I got back kind of late last night into my hotel room. Okay. So. Yeah. So here we have, can you see this quite well on your, do you got your laptop? I have a different laptop I'm using. Yes. Okay. So you can see this quite well. Yeah. It's coming up. Yeah. So uh, what do you think about what we've been doing here? Putting the present truth application here. I don't know how much you've seen of, of yesterday, but the first part seemed pretty straightforward. Um, taking uh, because we had addressed all that in Daniel, uh, well, basically ten verse one and then eleven verse one to four, and those seem to fit uh, really well with the Persian kingdom, right? So dealing with uh, the Persian kingdom, that part one to two worked well. Then we started dealing with the Greek empire and that initial application there the, um, that we had done fits well. Now, we have to remember that the historical application, the way that it's it's written out here in these bold is uh, from Swearington or Swearington, whatever his name is. Uh, Beringen. Beringen, is that what it is? I'm just just asking. Yeah, I'm just look. I'm going to look up his name here. So, um, right. So this was his book on tidings. Yeah. So it's Mark. Yeah, Swearingen or Swearingen or Swearingen. I'm not sure how you say his name. Mark Alden Swearingen. Okay. So so this he had put together, and I had copied it back in 2017, and started putting in. The present truth, truth application next to uh, the historical application. And so when we look at uh, this first part here of the Greek Empire, we're going to take Alexander the Great as equal to the Soviet Union. Uh, when he stands, stands up, he's going to rule with great dominion and do according to his will. So this is referent. Now he says conquer a vast territory, but we're not necessarily, uh, you know, saying that the Soviet Union at that time conquers a vast territory because they do this over a long period of time. Uh, but when he stands up really at the height of his power, so this, this is symbolized, this conquering of this territory is the Soviet Afghan war, December 24th, 1979 to February 15th, 1989. And, and then when he shall stand up at the height of his power, November 9th, 1989, his kingdom shall be broken. Um, so we're not necessarily saying he shall stand up as, as this, at the height of his power when it comes to the Soviet Union. Um, now, this idea of standing up in, um, in the Hebrew is... Um, has lots of different meanings. So to say that it's the height of his power, you know, you could say we could apply that, I guess, to Alexander. But it's 
It's really the word Ahmad means to stand in various relations, literally and figuratively, intransitively and transitive. Abide, appoint, arise, cease, confirm, continue, dwell, be employed, endure, establish, leave, make, ordain. Um, so when he says uh, that he shall stand up, when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken. Well, that word could be translated cease, right? So it's it's not necessarily, you know, as straightforward as conquering um, a vast territory, right? So however we apply that to Alexander, um, you know, we know that he he does cease. So, you know, it could be set forth. It could be stand firm. Uh, it could also be tarry, right? So there's lots of different ways that word can be translated. But we know with Alexander, he develops this kingdom and then he's going to die, right? And when he dies, his kingdom shall be broken, right? It's going to be divided toward the four winds of heaven. So we, we understand that history. If we're applying this now um, to this period, his kingdom shall be broken. This we're, we're having the standing up as being November 9th, 1989, basically. Um, the doing according to his will is the Soviet and Afghan war. And then his kingdom shall be broken at his death, 323 BC. We're putting that as the end of the Soviet Union, December 25th, 1991. And shall be divided towards the four wind of heaven. Now, these are going to be the directions of the compass. So when it's derived, divided towards the four winds of heaven, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's divided into four kingdoms, because these are the directions of the compass, north, south, east, and west. Now, there are four uh, Hellenistic empires. So in some ways, I think we could probably change the stuff, the black in bold, a little bit. But we're just going to leave it for now. Um, and we're saying that this is... Um, the four winds of heaven uh, are going to be this, uh, the four Hellenistic empires. And I have their 9-11. Now, that's maybe not the best thing to put there because we're going to have 9-11 uh, later on. So I think this might have been uh, initially with uh, when I did this back in 2017. So... Um, how would we, how would we address now the reason why I put four winds of heaven we're going to deal with Islam right so we're going to say Islam is going to come against the United States uh, that's part of the this uh, destructive power of these winds but maybe nine eleven isn't the best thing to put there because it's divided towards the four winds of heaven and if we're going to take the four winds of heaven um, it doesn't really make sense to put that as nine eleven. So what could we put here? How, how are we understanding this? Could we, we put that this is four different divisions? And if we, we had these divisions, what would they be? Like to say that this is maybe like the UN, but in, in the four winds of heaven. Um, so the four Hell Hellenistic empires is there something that that I'm missing? Is there something that we we should understand here and how we're going to make a parallel? So I know people jumping in here, maybe not following the whole thing, might have trouble following what we're doing. But any any thoughts on that? So I don't think nine eleven is actually a good thing to put there. I don't know. When I hear four winds, I'm thinking of something global, something worldwide. And that, of course, would make me think of the UN. And then I was thinking, okay, the death in 323. Well, three times two is six. And then you have a three. And I was thinking six, 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 like having six three times, making up six, six, six. But I often go off on tangents, as you know. So it's, hmm, I wonder if it has any six. Okay. Six at all, but. 
<clears throat> right over this cold. <laughs> yeah, okay. So Lots we're going to ponder here. <laughs> so if we're talking about the USSR, I mean, the USSR is the being divided towards the four winds of heaven, because that's what we're saying uh, Alexander's kingdom was. So putting 9-11 there doesn't make sense. I mean, obviously the UN. Um, so but we're saying that Alexander's kingdom, uh, which is the USSR, it represents more than just the USSR. It represents uh, the dragon power. Right. Because we have the world as the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. We have spiritualism. So we have their USSR as the actual nation that's going to have this situation. Um, so maybe we could just say globalism itself is what is divided towards the four winds of heaven. With the fall of the Soviet Union, globalism finds a new home. Now it's going to be under one ruler. That one ruler would be the UN. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. So we say the four, fam four former generals of Alexander, Ptolemy, Cassandra, Lysimachus, and Seleucus, and again, we just have the UN there. That would make more sense. So I, somehow I missed having the 9-11 there and re realizing that this is what is divided towards the four winds of heaven. So globalism now finds in this history from the fall of the Soviet Union, moving towards 9-11, um, a change, right? So the Soviet Union doesn't exist. But globalism still does. So when we get to verse 5, and the king of the south, and we're going to say the king of the south is the UN, the globalist, but yet we've said that it's been divided towards the four winds of heaven. So it's everywhere. But the UN is what is ruling this globalism. And so that's going to be represented by the king of the south. Now, is that consistent? Are we inconsistent in what we're doing? Are we consistent? Does that make sense to say that globalism is spread over the whole earth, but it's going to be under one ruler, the UN? Yeah, we have to recall that the 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 uh, Soviets, or even way prior to them, took a lot from Greece. I mean, look at their Greek Orthodox Church, for example. All the yeah. icons they have for that. There's quite okay. an influence there still. Yeah, it's just here we're having trouble making this division because we have the UN, but we're saying, well, the UN is, is the king of the south, yet we say that these four directions of the compass, north, south, east, and west, are all globalist but we know when we get to the king of the south we're now dividing this into globalists the un and the united states so so we're giving the characteristic of the king of the south that is the characteristic of the telemic empire we're going to attach that to the un itself and one of his princes that is seleucus so dwight you would notice that we've we've accepted this view because this makes more sense in the context of the, the present truth application that we're going to say that because of that alliance between um, Seleucus and, and Ptolemy prior to Seleucus conquering the three geographical locations, that this is um, – one of the princes of the UN is the USA. That's one of the countries, one of the powerful countries, one of the main uh, elements of the UN is, is the US. So, so the US shall be strong above the UN, right? And have dominion, gain the territory of Syria, Aram, which is the global economy. So the idea here, and, and that's gonna be that trade route, right? So 
uh, the United States, even though it's part of this UN, this globalist conglomeration, whatever you want to call it, the UN of all these countries, it is actually the leading country. It's the one that controls the economy, the vast, uh, you know, has the greatest portion of the global economy of any single country. So, so when we say that it shall be a great dominion, that's referring to this largest territory of the Hellenistic empires. We can just uh, say that that's the American economic empire that controls the world. It doesn't control the governments directly, but it controls them through economy. Now, when we get to the end of years after the first and second Syrian wars, now the end of years, what did we categorize that as? Where did we attach the end of years? So here they have the first and second uh, Syrian wars, and we're not going to parallel the first and second Syrian wars or anything directly, but that's what he had. Um, they, Ptolemy, the second Philadelphus, and Antiochus, the first Soter, should join themselves together, conclude peace in 252 BC. So we're going to mark that as 9-11. So the end of years is not the time of the end, right? Now, we had things about this is that we could tie this to 9-11, right? So we had used the numbers, and we're going to... We're going to put a lot of this stuff in here. We're going to, once we're done with this, we'll put in the charts. We'll put all the different calculations. Um, but we used uh, these numbers, 7093 for N, and the word Shana being 8141 for years. And um, we were able to use spans of time. So the one is the 8141 is... Um, if it's the number of days from uh, th from 9-11 to December 25th, 2023. So that's an inclusive count. And then we had uh, 7 0, uh, what was it, 7 0 9 3. And that's going to be, or, um, where is this here? I'm trying to find it on this chart. I know you're not looking at it, but so the word end um, 7093. I just don't see it. Don't remember what I did with seven zero nine. Um, anyway, it's somewhere in that chart. Did, so this helped us. I think there was the addition of it somewhere, but I just don't see how it fits. Around you don't re want mem remember what seven zero nine three was. No. Maybe if I look at this other chart. Um, oh, I, I, what it was was simply um, uh, we, we had it where we arranged the digits in a different order. So it could go from Stephen's birthday, 7309, to uh, February 15th, 1989. I think that was one. There's something else. Um, so it's going to bring us to the end of that war. I think that was that was it. Anyway, for now, I don't remember all the details of that. I'm going to have to go back over and look at it. But when we get to the end of years, the point was with Stephen's birthday, we connect to 9-11. And Stephen's birthday also connects to the end of the war through that symbol. Um, so 
so we're saying that the end of years is going to be 9-11. So if we're going to put it here, so it's going to be after all of this, these conflicts. Um, so we're going to get to 9-11. So, and, and we're going to see that at that point, um, so we just have 9-11 again and 9-11. They, at the end of years, they're going to join themselves together, conclude peace in 252 BC. We're going to connect this with 9-11. Now, how do we connect 9-11 with the symbol of the 2520? Is there is there a connection between 9-11 and the 2520? Does the 252 BC represent that? Do we have any connection between these two? Are you asking symbolically or numerically, or both? Both. So when we deal with the 2520 in Millerite history, it's going to end October 22nd, 1844, right? Yeah. So that 2520 at least, there's another 2520, but that one ends October 22nd, 1844. Um. Now, we know that 9-11 is the symbol that we attach to April 19th, 1844. We also attach it to August 11th, 1840. But as the arrival of the second angel, it's going to be parallel to the first angel arriving, or not the first angel, but the second angel arriving on the first day of the first month. But we know that it that 9-11 becomes uh, a part of this structure that goes from 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday long. That is, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down at 9-11. But Ellen White has that angel coming down at the Sunday long. So our history of our movement here is 9-11. Um, but 9-11 is the start of the Sunday law. It's not the end of the Sunday law, right? So in Jeff's line, we have 9-11, midnight cry, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. So we can see that that is connected. It's connected to the end of this, this message. Now, numerically, um, we have, well, there's lots of different connections that we, that we could have through the story of Ezra, um, um, we can connect 9-11 to uh, April 5th, 2030. So there's all of these sort of rather complicated connections. That is, there's all of these things are part of this whole picture that we would call the Sunday law. So, you know, so we have 9-11 and we have this peace between the king of the north and the king of the south. That is, uh, we have this, this globalism and the USA um, joining themselves together because of what happens at 9-11. So 9-11 here, um, it also ties, of course, to Islam, right? So we know it's going to be because of this attack of Islam. So maybe what we would we would look at is that we have two different... Uh, 9-11s here. We have one that connects with April 19th, 1844. Or not, well, we have one that connects with April 19th, 1844, all the way to October 22nd, 1844, that history. But we also have another one that has to do with the empowerment of the first angel. Right. So we can say that 
um, after the end of years, after the first and second Syrian war, after the first and second woe, so to speak, tying it to August 11th, 1840, we have 9-11 as the empowerment of the first angel. Right. And then we also have here 9-11 as the imp as the arrival of the second angel. Does that make, make sense? And you can see how then this peace treaty at 9-11, the arrival of the second angel in that symbol is, is connected more with the Sunday law than the empowerment of the first angel is. So we have Islam, right, involved here. So you can see the first and second Syrian wars can symbolize uh, the first and second woe, in which at the end of that second woe, you have the empowerment of the first angel in Millerite history, and 9-11 symbolizes that. Is that making sense to people? And you can see how this represents our line really well, right? The fall of the Soviet Union, which is preceded by the Soviet-Afghan War. Um, and then, of course, the wall being torn down, the Berlin Wall, November 9th, 1989. And then the fall of the Soviet Union, December 25th, 1991. Uh, then this characteristic atheism, globalism, all these different isms that we could, communism, we can then say that this is going to pass to the UN, right? Now, one of the, the princes of Ptolemy, who is, is the king of the south, he's then going to represent the king of the north. So, now, so this is the UN, but the king of the south, particularly the one that represents the UN, is the globalistic aspect. The United States is not, it do, it's not really a globalist power. It is a global power, right? The United States is this global economy. And that's why globalism is attractive to the US. Now, I was um, reading some material regarding um the American economy, the global aspects of the economy. And uh, the United States has actually created this ability for this trade to occur all over the world because of its military. That is, the world is dependent upon its economy because of what America does mil militarily, right? It makes the ocean safe so that... Uh, transportation of goods can occur. But if the United States didn't step in and do this, uh, we wouldn't have the global economy we have today. Does that make sense to people? I don't know if anybody- It's logical. Says, yeah. And so this is something that, that's well known. And, um, you know, when we talk about, you know, the American economy, it's always about how much money, how big a part of the global economy it is. But it's it's supported by its military. That's why America has just its military all around the world. It's policing the ocean. It's it's the thing that is providing uh, this trade to occur for this global economy to exist. And if the United States was removed, you wouldn't have the freedom of trade that you see today. Right. So the United States is 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 doing this. So it has this global economy. Now it says that we apl apply that to gain the territory of Syria or Iran. So this is really where the global trade routes are going through, through Syria. They go through Palestine as well. But they go through that area that ties together uh, the Mediterranean and, and you know Greek and all that with the trade routes um, going to the east. 
Um, and of course, you know, they have the Mediterranean Ocean, you have boats and ships as well. But a lot of that trade goes through land. And even then you still have the coasts in in that area in, in Palestine. So, so we have this dominion. So the the one that is strong above it is that is the USA. It's strong above the UN. It's the global economy is controlled by the United States. So we can see then um, after the first and second Syrian wars, 9-11, which is the empowerment of the first angel, then you're going to have 9-11 as a symbol of the arrival of the second angel. So both are there. And we have that 252 BC. For the king's daughter, Berenice, daughter of Ptolemy II. Now we're saying that this is a a religious philosophy. It's represented by a woman. Uh, but we're going to say it's wokeism. Wokeism is just a shortcut for lots of different things. I mean, it, it represents the new age. It represents all of these philosophies of the world um, that are not Christian, that are, in, in a sense, based on atheism or spiritualism, um, that are counter to God's word. And um, so, so this this daughter, this wokeism, is a daughter of of Egypt, the king of the south, the UN, right? So he he puts there Egypt. He could have put the Ptolemaic Empire, right? So that black bolded stuff that we didn't supply. But we can see that that's the UN, the United Nations. She'll come to the king of the north. So Antiochus the second here, who has Syria. He's the USA, right? This is the king of the north, the United States, to make an agreement, peace through marriage alliance. So this happens in connection with 9-11. Now, we can say, well, this has been going on for a long time. But um, uh, the reason that we would place this at 9-11 has to do with what happens as far as law. We go from common law to Roman law. We have a change in how the United States now relates to what's happening with the globalist agenda. Right? Now, of course, this has been going on for a while, right? I mean, this is going back even to 1989, even before. But definitely there is a uh, something that happens there. Now, we're gonna, now, he says they make an agreement, peace through a marriage alliance. So we would say, well, this is, um, if we're going to label it as something, we could probably say that um, the ironically named um, Patriot Act would be representative of this marriage alliance. Now, how would the Patriot Act, Patriot Act be a marriage alliance? And we also would put not just the Patriot Act, but internally we would put um, uh, spiritual formation here too when it comes to the Adventist church. So does that make sense to anybody? Or, it's yeah. more of a, it, it's really more of a lead because it's, it's agreeing that instead of the United States being a sovereign nation, it is going to accept the decisions and the and positions that others in the world have taken. Okay, so yeah, so a marriage is a league, right? Right. And so this is a type of league. The Patriot Act is um, connecting because it's it's really badly named act. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, Orwellian in in name, right? You know, it's it's that double speak. The new speak, whatever you want to call it, calling something really the opposite of what it is. It's not about patriotism at all. <laughs> it's really about giving up uh, uh, a type of sovereignty, sovereignty, right? Right. Okay. Okay, so this is through this wokeism that we end up with. And that's why I put spiritual formation in there. It's part of the symbols of the spiritual aspect of it. Um, but this marriage alliance is is a civil act 
through this thing called the Patriot Act, right? So a marriage alliance, even though it has a religious aspect, it also has a civil aspect. So both are here. But she, that's Berenice, wokeism. So again, it's just a shortcut for lots of things. She'll not retain the power of her arm. That is, she's going to lose position from the former queen, Laodice. So we're saying that Laodice, Laodice, Laodice is republicanism. That is, that's Protestant. Um, in Protestant America, we have these two aspects, Protestantism and republicanism. And this is republicanism. The republicanism has a religious aspect to it as well in the United States. So. I mean, we could almost say apostate republicanism, right? But republicanism as it exists in this history. And neither shall he, that is the USA, stand, right? So the USA is not going to be able to stand. Um, now, again, when we look at that word stand, that word has, we've already looked at it. It has showed up before. Um, and, and so we know that it's, it's the same word, Ahmad, and it means abide, appoint, arise, cease, confirm, continue, dwell, be employed, endure, right? So obviously something's happening, uh, to the United States. And so she shall not retain the power of her arm. Neither shall he stand. So we have Berenice. Um, and, and the United States. Both of them are weakened. But she shall be given up. So this would be Berenice. And they that brought her. And he that begat her is what the King James movie says. Uh, those whom she begat. Or him whom she begat. And he shall be strengthened. And he that strengthened her in these times. Right. So. And this was part of where we are having a bit of trouble yesterday. So I had. Um, I worked on this a little bit uh, in between yesterday and, and this morning. Um, so we're going to say that. Um, so. So when it says lose her position from the former Queen Laodice, I'm just saying Laodice is republicanism. So, but the question is, how does that happen? Now we're saying, well, Berenice, wokeism, shall not retain the power of the arm. Now the arm is military power, right? So the question is, when does this happen? Is this something that has happened during the time of, let's say, Trump? So we could say Republicanism under Trump or something like that, if that's what we're looking at. That wokeism does not retain the power of the arm. But yet we know that wokeism still continues. So this could be something future. Now it says, neither shall he, Antiochus, the USA, stand stand assassinated by Laodice republicanism. So how would we how would we do that if we're saying that you know Laodice is going to attack the United States, is Republican or not be able to stand because of republicanism? How would that be? So that that's part of the problem here because we're saying Antiochus II represents uh, the U.S. government, right? so the USA, not the land, but the U.S. government. So is there something that we're someplace where we have to put this, that it makes sense? Do we say that Laodice is republicanism or is Laodice something else? Because it, it's, it's a woman that we could say. You know, it's it's something else other than republicanism. Maybe Republican Protestantism, maybe Republicanism, Republicanism 
mixed with Protestantism that affects the USA. And then says, nor his arm, Berenice's son. I put Berenice's son as the Democrats. So that Republicanism, the Democrats. Now, originally I had Biden there at the end of the study yesterday, put Biden, but I wasn't really happy with that. And I would just say, um, but I'm saying, nor his arm, that is the arm of the Democrats. The, the, do the Democrats have an arm? His arm usually refers to military power. So is this somehow focusing upon what happened you know, in the past under Trump or something that's happening in the future? Of course, we have still more verses to deal with as well. Any thoughts on this? Or have I created a model for us and how I've been interpreting this? Well, okay. I don't That's see, a good note there. I see, I see the comment. Okay, so Angela says here, um, Ptolemy means aggressive, warlike, and Tychus resistant, holding out against. Um, so this is a great controversy illustrated, is what Angela says. But it's more than one Laodice, meaning decision of the people. Right? So that's what Laodice means. It refers to democracy. So so we have it here as republicanism, but maybe it's maybe it has more to do with the democratic the democratic process. So how could we rethink this? So we say that Berenice is wokeism. Right? And technically what is wokeism? Okay. Okay, Dwight? Yeah. I, I'm having trouble hearing you, but I'm saying I'm, so, I, I'm sorry. This is the best I've got for the moment. Okay. 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 Well, Te technically what is wokeism? Well, it's communism. Um, it's the it's a misuse of the human rights, a misuse of the constitutional principles. If you distill it even further, isn't wokeism paganism? Okay. Well, yes, it definitely is. It's spiritualism, paganism, witchcraft, all that kind of stuff. Shamanism. Okay. Berenice, so, victory bringer. So, um, so we're attaching Berenice. So she's a daughter of the king of the south. So, okay, go on with the paganism. So how would you then address this? Well, the founding fathers of the United States. Many of them were deists. Mm -hmm. The situation was none of them were outward paganists. Right. Because we didn't we didn't see the issues arising in the United States in the 1780s that we saw in France. Mm -hmm. Yes. I agree. Now we're seeing this type of similar issue coming up within the United States, very, very much like what was coming up within France, because we have all of these little groups that want to stand up for their rights. And okay. we have. Okay, you follow my thought process? Yes. So so this kind of turns the lights on for me. So something I guess I probably should have noticed before, but okay. they do call me Captain Obvious for a reason. Um, so uh, what I think that I see is that 
there's this revolution that happens in France. It moves from France to the Soviet Union, right, in right. the early um, 1900s, right, the 20th century. No, it, it moves it moves from France at the beginning of the 19th century okay. to, to Russia and then right. the Soviet Union, but it first occurs in Russia. Right. Right. It does. And and so, you know, I've read Russian literature, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. And and this was developing um in in the 1800s, right? So this was developing yes. in Russia. That is, the Russians loved the French. They thought the two best, the, the two most beautiful languages in the world were Russian and French. Right. And and you know, the people who were trying to be aristocratic and cool and so forth would always speak a little bit of French, usually quite poorly. Um, but, you know, this was just a sign of sophistication that you could speak some France, French, right? And, of course, the licentiousness of France also was predominant in Russia, right? So if anybody knows anything about Russian history... It was very licentious, just as France was, because it, you know, it wasn't Protestant. Like in, obviously in England, you had a much more conservative uh, aspect to, you know, human interactions, right? Than you had in France or Russia. Okay, so so we see it moving to Russia, and then it's going to be formulated in the Soviet Union. So the Soviet right. Union carrying this torch, so to speak. But then it's going to move because of what happens to the Soviet Union with the United States and the papacy combining to overthrow the Soviet Union. It now really brings that revolution through a series of steps to the United States, right? Through the United Nations, through all of these events. There's lots of events. It's all happening progressively, but we can mark certain events as waymarks, right? Correct. So this makes more sense to me. All of a sudden, you know, our light's coming on for other people as well. That, and, and we've already paralleled what happened in France with our history. Now, I think we we did it um, without really understanding fully what we were doing. So, you know, one of the things that we were doing with Trump is we were looking at Trump almost as a comparison to Napoleon, right, in some ways, right? Which really doesn't okay. make sense, right? No, it, just it, the populism and so forth. Yeah, okay, go on, Dwight. It, you were right. That was not making sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but where we were at the time, you know, that's just us trying to sort this out. Agreed. The movement was trying to sort things out. Just because we we think something doesn't mean it's always correct because it's leading us somewhere else. So there's a progression and unfolding of life. But we had some of the right ideas, but I think we had the wrong players as fulfilling those roles back, you know, in 2017, 18, 19. Um, even 2016, you know, when we started looking at Trump, because the movement was looking at Trump to do things that the Trump won't do, you know, so. OK, so when we look at this wokeism, I mean, we, we know that it's it's paganism. It's. Um, and, and it exists within these different philosophies, right? Paganism it just has a different, it takes on a different garb in different histories and different uh, times, right? I mean, really, papalism is just paganism dressed up as Christianity. But we see it, we see it moving all the way through. And Ellen White talks about spiritualism, the spiritualism that was arising at the end of the 1800s into the early 1900s. That type of spiritualism was 
not obviously spiritualism to many people, right? They wouldn't have looked at it as, you know, witchcraft and all those things in the way that, uh, you know, that they wouldn't think of it as paganism. In some ways, it was sort of promoted as a type of, of pseudoscientific, you know, they were looking for something to substitute Christianity, um, some kind of spiritualism, right? So to them, even even the pantheism of um, E.J. Wagner and uh, Kellogg, you know, it was very popular in the Christian churches uh, in England, right? So this was something that was a very fashionable type of Christianity, this, this new pantheism. Now, they didn't call it pantheism, right? Ellen White labels it as pantheism. But they, they wouldn't think of it. They would think of it as, as uh, a sort of uh, spiritualism in, in a Christian sense, right? Just being, it's a type of mysticism maybe to some degree. But to them, it was about understanding the Holy Spirit and how God works and sort of that there's, some explanation for how God works within the physical world, right? If you've read any of Wagner's stuff dealing with that or Kellogg's stuff, right? So, so this type of, it's, it's all related to wokeism. It's all related to pa uh, paganism. Okay. So, so now when we look at this and we see that there's this agreement, so we're going to look at this agreement, uh, it's the Patriot Act, spiritual formation. So it's formalized in this formal agreement on a, on a secular level, but it's really a connection with, with spiritualism. And it's done through Berenice, right? So this woman, this wokeism, this philosophy, a religious philosophy that, um, that this alliance is done through. But this will not retain the power of the arm. Now, so the power of the arm is military power. So what would this represent? Because I just have there, you know, Laodicea is, is republicanism, but I'm not really explaining what event is. So would this be the rise of, of Trump, let's say, that somehow wokeism, which comes in in 9-11, Trump makes, he stirs up all against the realm of Grisha. So he gets the power of the arm for a time. It, it, is that where we would place this? Or is there some other way to understand this? Because it, neither shall he stand. So the he standing, where he applies it to Antiochus II, because he's going to be assassinated by Laodice, Laodice, um, but if Laodice is, we're saying this democratic principle, how are we going to understand this? So you understand what I'm saying? So let's look back at this sentence. I know this is not easy to sort of, uh, at least for me, it's not easy to conceptualize. So she, Berenice, so Berenice is this wokeism, shall not retain the power of her, her arm. So wokeism comes into the United States, right, through at 9-11. And she has the power of the arm for a time, but she's going to lose this from Laodice. Now, if Laodice, Laodice, Laodice is the decision of the people, are we going to say that Laodice, Laodice is just the democratic process? But does that make sense to make the democratic process this woman that was set aside? Now, if we think about what happened at 9-11, is, is democracy set aside at 9-11 with this alliance between the UN and the US. It certainly was. Yeah. Human rights were. Okay. So human rights was. So now 
Now, the Democrats, of course, as as uh, a party, are different from the democratic process, For sure. right? Yeah. So, so just like Republicanism as a party is different from the idea, like the Republican Party is different really than the idea of Republicanism, because it's Republicanism is a form of government where you have a constitution, it's the rule of law, where democracy is the rule of the people. Okay. So wokeism, it comes into the United States. I keep thinking, sorry, Theodore, I keep thinking standing up. I keep thinking of Christ standing up when Stephen was stoned and standing up meaning a kind of a judgment or you're monitoring something and you're you're for the person who is being persecuted, right? Okay. And Trump in a way stood against a lot of the, the like news and the deep state and all this stuff and then it was all overturned with Biden. Okay. So so when we go back to um uh, let me see King. I'm just trying to look back here. So the Dominion, I'm going back, the Ptolemy shall join themselves together. For the king's daughter, Berenice of the South, shall come to the king of the North to make an agreement through a marriage alliance. But she, Berenice, shall not retain the power of the arm. So that's going to be this woman, wokeism. Now, it doesn't say anywhere in here about Laodicea until Berenice is assassinated by, um, or Berenice is assassinated by Laodicea, right? So when they have this alliance, and we know that it occurs, we know Laodicea is set aside. She's exiled. But it doesn't mention her exile, so to speak, in... Um, in this history, we don't have a verse saying uh, it just says the king's daughter, Berenice of the south, shall come to the king of the north. She'll make an agreement, right? But we're going to find out that this. Um, so Laodice, Laodice is not really directly mentioned, right? Does, does that make sense? Like we don't have Laodice directly mentioned in the text referred to. It's it's just implied. So when we're putting it in there, I mean, Laodice is there in the story, but she's not mentioned directly, right? We can agree with that. But the reason why Berenice does not um, retain the power of the arm, and neither does Antiochus II stand, is because of... Laodice. But we, we know, so we know Laodice is there. She's just not mentioned directly. So what, what I think we have to do is, uh, I mean, I agree that Laodice is there, but in trying to just like label Laodice, we, we need to understand the process. So, so Berenice, wokeism comes in. Now, this is paganism, communism. It comes in because of the connection of the United States to, to deal with this war on terror. This becomes an international war on terror. The United States has made an alliance in this regard because of what happens at 9-11. So, but Berenice shall not retain the power of the arm. So this arm 
is we usually think of the arm as military. Can we think of it as political? I think so, because we have left wing and right wing, so why not left arm and right arm? <laughs> okay, so it loses in the democratic uh, process, Eleanor, or loses in the democratic process with the election of Trump. Now, does that make any sense to anybody? Would you repeat that, please? Okay. So she shall not receive the power of the arm. That is, right. she's going to lose the position from former Queen Leia to Sisi, which means decision of the people. That is, she loses in the democratic process with the election of Trump. Right. So that's why she doesn't retain the power of the arm. Prior to that, the power of the arm here is, is the political process in the United States. And right. woke is, has control of that. Right. All right. Behind the scenes, but still, it, it is it is still predominant in the United States. We see this this stuff happen. Now, they're going to lose in the democratic process with the election of Trump. Trump is is fighting against all of these ideas of wokeism, the global the globalists. But it's in this this form of wokeism, right? So we have this democratic process. That's Leo DC. The decision of the people. So neither shall he. Now, when we have Antiochus the second, and we said that um, Antiochus uh, or Seleucus the first, and Antiochus the first, you know, these are representative of of the king of the north, right? So here, Antiochus the second is you know, the king of the north still. Now we say it's the U.S. So neither shall he, the USA, stand. They're also going to be assassinated by Laodice, right? So that is, uh, they lose to the elect in the, you know, they lose in this election, right? So to say it's Republicanism, you know, so it's going to be, again, just what we said regarding this election, but it's, it's going to be he, the USA, neither shall he stand. So what happens with the USA that it doesn't stand? Now, so this Laodice is, is, is fickle. The decisions of the people, what's the problem with the democracy compared to a republic? So we're going one, to see. Yeah, go, go on. One of them is the the rule of majority, and one is for individual rights. Right. So the majority. So they they're always in conflict with each other. Right. Right. Because if you have um, a democracy, that means the majority can decide to take away the rights of, of, the, of individual, the individual, right? In, in a republic, the rights of the individual are foremost, even though you have a democratic process for electing rulers, you can't change your constitution, or you shouldn't, through a democratic process. That is, the rights of the individual are to be protected apart from any decision that the public makes, that the majority makes. 
So it protects the right uh, rights of the individual. Now, one of the things that happened with this wokeism with, with human rights is that they started to group people into what we call minorities, that we had to protect the rights of minorities. But if individual rights are protected, the rights of minorities are automatically protected, right? Correct. Once you start recognizing groups of minorities, right. then the rights of the individuals become trampled upon, right? And as I've said many times, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who used to be the Prime Minister of Canada, who wrote uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms um, in the Canadian Constitution, um, his son is Justin Trudeau, who's now Prime Minister, but his dad, in an interview I saw, he said that this Charter of Rights and Freedoms makes this perfect balance between the rights of the individual and group rights. Now, of course, you can't have a balance between the rights of the individual and group rights because group rights will always devour individual rights. So, so this is the difference between republicanism and uh, democracy, a republic and a democracy. Republic can have a democratic process, but the law, the rights of the individual are protected. Now, so if we say that the USA doesn't stand, um, we can see that the same process, this decision of the people that put Trump in office, office also removes Trump from office, right? Right. Okay, so, so, you know, where we're trying to place this, I mean, I'm, I'm still not certain about lots of things, so we're working through this. Um, but if he, the USA, if Antiochus II here is being the one that's neither shall he stand, he's assassinated by Laodice, Laodice um, and I put, well, assassinated by republicanism. But we could just say here again, but this is the democratic process. Now, we say that the USA comes to an end uh, dealing with the election of, of Joe Biden, right? So when Trump loses. So if we put this here, that, that the United States is also, this is also the decision of the people, this would be the election of Biden. But then says, nor his arm. So I put, well, Berenice's son. So, so he shall not stand, but neither shall Berenice's son. Now, we, we say that Berenice's son, well, obviously that's a descendant of Berenice. So I would say, well, Berenice's wokeism, the son is the Democrats. That's what I put. I put before Biden. Um, But how would we understand Berenice's son? So Berenice is this wokeism. So what is the son? So the son is not a woman, first thing, right? We yes, the son, is, the son is male, yeah. Okay. So the son's not a woman, so it's not a church as a woman is. But even putting Laodicea here, she's not mentioned specifically in scripture. We're just saying that when we go back in history, it refers to the decision of the people. Laodicea. Leo meaning peace, DC meaning decision. Okay. So as, yeah. as Laodicea is not mentioned in scripture, is she the woman behind the scenes? Well, well, she's, she's the woman who's involved in this democracy, this democratic process, because that's what her name means. And, you know, in this battle between these different powers, wokeism here, paganism, and, um, 
you know, the United States. So we have this, this battle going on, this revolution in the United States. Laodice is this, um, and that's where you get that word dice, right? Dice is related to the word, uh, correct? That's not a false etymology. I don't know. I could be wrong. Even if it's a false etymology, it's a good one. I'm just looking it up here. It could be, you know, it just means to cut into cubes. Okay. Like slice and dice. Okay. But anyway, um, we can see that people make decisions with dice. So that's the way I think of it um, when it comes to decisions, right? <clears throat> but the point there is the fickleness of the will of the people, the decision of the people is fickle, right? So, so when we say the USA falls, um, we can also say that this is the election of Biden, right? But now we're going to have, um, and, and that's going to be involved in what happens on January 6th and all that as well. But nor his arm. So this is the arm of who? Neither shall he stand, nor his arm. So we're saying the arm is Berenice's son. That's what Swearingen says. Now, is that is that the correct interpretation of that verse? To say that that part of the verse refers to uh, Berenice's son. Um, any thoughts on that? Because. Uh, uh... When we look at uh, what happened there, it's more like what happened to Alexandria when Alexandria died. Then also, the the, the son, the, the the family was more like ex executed. And when we look at uh, Ber Bernice, it's uh it's more like the same because uh it's uh loud C loud 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 C when uh she she made that uh that the husband has to be. Uh, eliminated because she was scared that uh, again she would be chased away from the from 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 her matrimonial home. Then we find that uh, she's the one who's engineering to kill the wife as well as the son. That's uh, that's how I understand that uh, the old story, and uh, that's when the brother now to Bernice will come in to to revenge the death of uh, the sister. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's, when you look at these verses, we've made an application of these verses to this history. So here's what uh, Uriah Smith says. Um, so it's a little bit different than the swearing games. Okay. So the King of the North, this is the section on Daniel 11, verse six. There were frequent wars between the Kings of Egypt and Syria, right? Between the, the king of the south, the Ptolemaic Empire, and Syria, the northern empire. Especially was this the case with Ptolemy Philadelphus, the second king of Egypt, and Antiochus Theos, the third king of Syria. They at length agreed to make peace upon condition that Antiochus should put away his former wife, Laodice, and her two sons, and should marry Berenice, the daughter of Ptolemy Philadelphus. So that's the daughter of the king of the south. Ptolemy accordingly brought his daughter to Antiochus, bestowing with her an immense dowry. Bestowing her with an immense dowry. She shall not retain the power of the arm. That is her interest in power with Antiochus. So, so in this interpretation, where he says, um, um, she shall not retain the power of her arm lose position from the former Queen Laodice, right? So he loses in the democratic process with the election of Trump. Neither shall he stand, nor his arm, 
Now they put his arm as being Berenice's son. So when we, uh, um, he's going to go on and talk about this. But she shall not retain the power of the arm. That is her interest and power within Tychus. So it proved. For shortly afterward, Antiochus brought back to the court his former wife, Laodice, and her children. Then says the prophecy, neither shall he, Antiochus, stand nor his arm. And he puts here, or posterity. Laodice, being restored to favor and power, feared, lest in the fickleness of his temper, Antiochus should again disgrace her by recalling Berenice. Concluding that nothing short of, the, of his death would be an effectual safeguard against such a contingency, she caused him to be short, poisoned shortly afterward. Neither did his children, by Berenice, succeed him in the kingdom. The Laodice so managed affairs to obtain the throne for her eldest son, Seleucus Callinicus. But she, Berenice, shall be given up. Laodice, not content with poisoning her husband Antiochus, caused Berenice and her infant son to be murdered. They that brought her, all of her Egyptian women in attendance, in endeavoring to defend her, were slain with her. He that begat her, the margin is whom she brought forth, that is her son, who was murdered at the same time by order of Laodice. He that strengthened her in these times was doubtless her husband Antiochus, or those who took part and defended her. Now, so, in that history, it's quite clear what the history is, but how we apply the verses may not be exactly correct. Now, we know that Antiochus does not stand, but it says, nor his arm. Now, they put here Berenice's son. Now, is Berenice's son his arm? I think because uh, she's the one who was uh, going to be the king if uh, the king had died. Yeah. But the arm here can't refer to his son. I mean, the son's going to be mentioned later, right? Or, right. right because that son is going to be whom she begat. Uh, I understand that that's the son, Berenice's son, whom she has with Antiochus. So, so it doesn't make sense, nor his arm, to be Berenice's son. So we have the arm being what? What is the arm? Because when we say shall not retain the power of the arm earlier, Benisi, shall not retain the power of the arm, lose her position from the former queen Laodice, which is the decision of the people, loses in the democratic process with the election of Trump. Um, so with the election of Biden, nor his arm, this would much more refer to, to what? What is the arm here? How are we defining the arm in this context in our present position? I think uh, in that one with Trump, we can, uh, can we put it uh, with uh, the agendas that uh, Trump had? Because when we look at uh, the way Joe Biden is coming in, He's coming up with uh, his own uh, theories to do with the uh, promotion of uh, 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 his on the climate change and also on the right side. But when we look at Donald Trump, he's uh, removing the United States from the UN. It's more like going this side. Then it's more like uh, the agenda that Trump had. It's more like it's being taken away. Okay. So if we're going to say that the power of his arm is military power, in that period, just because, I mean, he's killed. He doesn't retain his military power because um, that's how, you know, when you're dead, you definitely don't have your military power anymore. So he's no longer the king, his kingship, right, over the army. So we, we wouldn't put Democrats here. So the USA does not stand but something happens to its military power when Biden is elected. 
of what happens to the American military power when Biden is elected. Well, it's gone woke too. Okay. It's here. Okay. So, so it's been weakened, perverted. Okay, so it, but it's more than just being woke. Um, I mean, would we say it's, um, you know, impotent? When they withdrew from um, Afghanistan? Yeah, Afghanistan there. Um, we definitely don't see the United States. I mean, the United States is not able to maintain peace under Trump. No. If Trump, and you know, in hindsight's 50 50, but I would say if Trump had still, was still president, we wouldn't see uh, the war in the Ukraine. Russia would not have invaded the Ukraine, and we wouldn't see the war in the Middle East, right? Right, because uh, even Trump himself, he said that uh, if uh, he was the president, which simply means that war in uh, Ukraine would have finished. But when we look at uh, Joe Biden, it's more like he's just a puppet. He doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and it becomes impotent. So the American military power becomes impotent. That's the way that I would look at it. So uh, Antiochus loses, that is the United States, loses through this. Um, and, and we're going to say that this is the USA. This is the king of the north. This is the USA in what it, it represents. You know? um, but it's assassinated, in a sense, by the decision of the people, the election of Biden. And it doesn't retain its military power. That is... The American military ter 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 power becomes impotent. Now, now Berenice shall be given up. Now, Berenice is is wokeism. That's what it says. Berenice is given up. So we know that she's going to be executed by Laodicea. Laodicea. And so, how does this fit in with what we've just we've just done? So we're, we're going to say that, you know, America loses its military power. It becomes impotent, impotent. But she, this is Berenice. So this is the kings of the north's, uh, or, or the kings of the south daughter, right? So this is Wokins that was given to the king of the north. Shall be given up, right? So again, Berenice, we say, equals Wokeism. So we need to put that in there. Shall be given up, executed by Laodicea. That is, this is something that is happening at this time, right? So, um, so we would have to say, then this is what? So what is, so again, Laodicea is the decision of the people. Right. Now, now we, yep. The, the question is, have we seen the tide yet turn against wokeism? Or is wokeism going to, is there going to be further battles where wokeism uh, takes on a new form and, and increases its power, right? Because we have the king of the north and the king of the south fighting against each other. Okay, so we're going to see the battle of Raphia and Penia, right? So here, when we're, we're doing this, it seems to me that these verses repeat again 
in some way that there's a repeat of history. <clears throat> because we're going to have out of the branch of Berenice's roots, and it's not going to be Napoleon, right? That we're going to look at this again. So, so in this, we're already putting this into our history, these verses. But yet the later verses, we also put into our history. So we're not putting this way back, you know, early in our lines. This, this becomes present truth in our lines right now. <clears throat> now, um, okay, so we're getting close to the end of the study here. Um, so again, I'm just going to throw some stuff in here that we're going to probably correct next time. But when wokeism is given up, executed by Laodice, Laodice that there is a backlash, right? So this is a backlash. against wokeism. So that's a public a public thing, right? It's not doesn't necessarily have to be a democratic vote to be the decision of the people. There starts to become this backlash against wokeism. Okay, so we'll put that in there. And they that brought her so uh, they would be the execution of the attendants also. So that is, there's going to be some casualties to those that brought wokeism in, right? Casualties or defeat? Well, I would say casualties of individuals. And, and I would say that this is still future. And he that begat her, or she that, she, um, he that, uh, she begat, right? The one whom she begat. See, that's, that's where that phrase, he that begat her, I'm having issues with that being her son. Uh, well, the one whom she begat? The one that she begat would be correct. Right. That's what I'm saying. That is what he put in brackets there. It's an alternate reading. Okay. She begat. Right. So the one whom she begat, that is how it should be translated. So the one who she begat is her son. Right. So... Right, I could do this um, like that. Even like this. Okay. So then we have to say, well, who is the son? And, and the one whom she begat. So it's going to be like this. And he that strengthened her in these times. Now we're going to say, well, he has Antiochus, the second, right? But it doesn't really make sense because. Who is it that strengthened uh, Berenice? Wouldn't it be Ptolemy the second? Well, let's look at this a little deeper first thing tomorrow. Okay, yeah. So anyway, we put some stuff here. Now, we're working through this. We don't know if we're right at this point. 
We're just saying, can we make this application? Can we take this little app application and just replace the historical application with a present truth application that makes sense? Now, we've already sort of done we this. We've done it a little bit differently. What's that? I said we have to. It's got to make sense. It has to be pertinent to us and our time. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we're going to come back to this tomorrow. So let's close with prayer. A dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here this morning, for each person who participated, and for your Holy Spirit's presence. We know, Lord, that you want us to go through this process to understand these <laughs> things, not just to have a surface understanding that doesn't fit, where there's contradictions. We know, Lord, that your word does not contradict itself. And so we just pray that you can help us in our personal study. Bring us together again to share. And we ask this according to thy word. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.